keep in mind that during the process of hypothesis testing, what we're doing is using sample data to try and draw conclusions about our population. We never know if we're right or wrong. We're basically making some hopefully very educated guesses, but that means there's the possibility that we could be wrong. And with hypothesis testing, there are two different ways to be wrong, or two different types of possible error. The general um, <clears throat> kind of uh, metaphor for this is to think about um, a trial. If you've ever watched Law and Order or any of the other dozen cop shows that are on at any given time, or court shows, or if you've ever been on jury duty, you've been asked or seen someone on TV ask to sit on a trial and uh, render a verdict about that person being guilty or innocent. And we're supposed to start with the assumption that a person is innocent until proven guilty. So that idea is similar to our null and alternative hypotheses. A person is innocent, so we start off with the null hypothesis that a person is innocent unless there's enough evidence to force us to throw that, to sit that um, assumption out and decide that they're guilty, which would be our alternative hypothesis. So that means for any trial situation, there are four different possible outcomes. So if a person is innocent and the verdict rendered by the jury is that that person is innocent, then that jury reached the correct decision. If the person is guilty of the crime they committed and the jury renders a guilty verdict, then that's also a correct decision. So in a courtroom case, we may never actually know whether the person really committed the crime or not. We just have the evidence that may or may not be overwhelming. The only person who probably knows for sure is the person who committed the crime. Just like in hypothesis testing, we never know for sure if we deliver back one of these correct answers or one of our incorrect answers. So still in the context of that um, judicial case, if our person on trial is innocent, and the verdict that's rendered is guilty, then we came to the wrong conclusion. We would refer to that as a type one error. So an innocent person being convicted. We could also be wrong if a guilty person is let go. So if that verdict comes back as innocent, and we would refer to that as a type two error. So we can measure the probability of each of these types of errors occurring. So the probability of a type one error occurring is our value alpha, the significance level that's set for our hypothesis test. And the probability of a type two error is referred to as beta, so the Greek letter for B. So we have these two values, alpha and beta, which reflect our probability of either committing a type one error or a type two error. So again, in the case of a type one error, we reject a true null hypothesis. So we reject that starting assumption, even though in reality it's true. So again, that's the same idea as an innocent person being convicted. In the case of a type two error, that means that we failed to reject a false, <clears throat> excuse me, a false null hypothesis. So we fail to reject this null hypothesis, meaning we maintain that original assumption, which is actually a false statement. So this is the same idea as a guilty person going free. So ultimately, again, keep in mind, we never know if we made the right decision or not. But what we can do is work to try to limit the probability that these errors occur. Controlling a type one error is pretty simple. It's done by simply selecting our value for alpha, the significance level for our test. Many of the problems we encounter are going to provide you with a value for alpha that you should use for the test, 
but if you're doing research on your own or when an independent researcher is researching something, um, they have to just choose that value for alpha. And there's some strategy that goes into it, but essentially by setting that value for alpha, we control the probability that type one error will occur. We do need to keep in mind that value needs to be selected before conducting a test as a way to avoid introducing bias to the test. So we need to know what that significance level is and then conduct our test. So if the consequence of a type one error occurring is something severe, then we wanna choose a smaller value for alpha, but our typical value is to let alpha be 0 0.05. So that's kind of our typical value, so about 5%. If it's a severe situation, we might wanna go with something smaller than that. If it's a less severe situation, we could go with a larger value. So controlling type one error is, e as a, is as easy as just selecting that value for alpha. Controlling type two error is a bit more complicated and not something we'll really go into too in depth in this class, but throughout the course of some of the topics that we cover, we will introduce some methods to help reduce that. One idea to keep in mind with these two different types of error is that alpha and beta, so our probability of a type one and a type two error are inversely related So that means as alpha gets smaller, our value for beta gets bigger. So that's the reason why we don't just always choose an incredibly small value for alpha, because if we did, we could choose alpha to be 0 .0000000, whole bunch of zeros and then one. That would mean we'd have a very low probability of a type one error, but choosing a value for alpha to be that small increases the probability of this type two error occurring. So just something to keep in mind, um, since we won't focus on beta too much, that is one of the reasons that we don't always choose incredibly small values for alpha. But in some cases we'll choose um, values for alpha like 0 0.01, that would be a more severe case. In a less serious case, we might let alpha be 0 0.1, so not as small of a value. And then every time alpha goes up or down, beta changes in that opposite direction. 